Welcome back. Now, our guest tonight is a best-selling author, philosopher. He is the founder and chairman of the School of Life, and he's someone who, whenever I listen to him, which is a lot, he makes me think about the world differently. And he's here from his home in the UK. He is the brilliant Alain Dubotin. I'm so happy that you're here, and it's it's so lovely to see you because I, I feel I should be honest and tell you that I had some surgery on my eye last week where I had to lie with a, a sort of warm flannel over my face and so I couldn't watch anything. And I think I've listened to every recorded piece of podcastery you have done over the last, I'm reckoning, six or seven years. Your voice oh has been rattling around my head. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed you made, it a, you made a recovery. Well, I've, all that. I've found it voice, deeply... It, it could have sent you back to, you know... Real ill health, but thank you, that's great. Well, I found it deeply calming. And, and what I found incredible when we talked before is that the news is so scary a lot of the time, everything we're hearing is scary, but you actually have quite an optimistic take on what we're going through. Can you explain that, that optimism and why it's there? Look, you know, in, in a way, it's rather than optimism, it's a silver lining. Um, as I say, I think one of the great things about this time is that we are rediscovering one another. You know, most of the time we are so busy, but also we have such a front. You know, we're all of us pretending to be this and that. And at this time, I'm, I'm loving the new vulnerability. You know, I've had so many conversations with people who are just able to be human in a way that very often they're not the rest of the time. It's such a gift. You know, when a friend calls you up and they say, you know, how are you doing? If you're able to just take them into the reality of your life. Um, that is such a present that you're giving them. Um, because so many of us think, I'm unusual, I'm so strange, other people are all having a great life, they're having a great time. This is a time when there's no more FOMO, you know, there's no fear of missing out during mm. the pandemic. There is no great party somewhere else. It's all of us fragile, suffering, vulnerable humans trying to hold it together with, you know, sometimes frightening moments. Um, and, and in a way, you know, the, 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 the kind of pretenses of the normal world that we've put up and suffer from have, have kind of gone. You know, also, a lot of people say to me things like, you know, I'm feeling anxious, you know, is it going to be okay? And I always say, you know, if you really want to calm somebody down, don't always stress that everything's going to be great, and everything's going to be terrific, etc. Look at some of the darkness in the face, you know, the Stoic philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome, they were fantastic because when they were trying to reassure people, rather than saying the bad stuff won't happen, they chose a different view. Look at the bad stuff and see that it can actually be survived. We are all of us much stronger than we think. We always think, oh, imagine if I couldn't go out. Imagine if you know this happened and that happened. We're in the middle of a crisis. And broadly speaking, touch wood, most of us are still just about coping. And even if we're not coping, not coping's okay. So I think it's making us stronger by, by revealing to us that we don't have to be perfect. We suffer so much from an idea of perfection. This is not perfect at all. These are not perfect days and still we're okay. But I think that's a really interesting thing, that notion of, of everything doesn't have to be okay. And it's okay to, um, to acknowledge that. Because you said something a couple of weeks ago on something I heard you do where you said that, that the brave face could be the biggest villain of this, the notion of putting on a brave face. Yeah. Tell me about okay. that. You know, the brave face has always been a problem. Men have had it worse than women in this regard. Well, you know, it's all this idea that in order to be a decent human being, you have to be an unafraid human being. And so most of us feel so weird because we have access to our own thoughts and our own fears and fragilities, but we only can guess what's going on in outside other people's minds from what they choose to tell us. And generally they edit the information heavily. And therefore, a lot of us end up thinking that we're very weird because what's going on in my head doesn't seem to have any echo with what's going on in somebody else's head. Actually, all of us experience many of the same things. We're full of self-doubt, we're full of regret, we're full of shame, we, we, but also we have longings for love. We, we want to be generous towards other people. We're just 
actually life is stranger than we're allowed to admit that it is. And I think great works of art, great works of comedy, great songs, they're always able to stretch our idea of what is normal. And that's why we appreciate them. You know, think of the best movies. They're able to kind of show what it's like to be a parent, to be in love, to go on a journey. And they give us the real picture. So often we live inside these very edited images. And I think let's use this crisis to be a bit more honest about what it's like to be human. You know, life is always an emergency. You don't need a plague to, to be reminded, but it mm. can be useful just to be reminded that, you know, we're all suffering, we're all afraid, we're all gonna die at some point. Um, keeping those things right at the center uh, of our kind of compass helps us to maybe focus on the essentials. It's so easy to get distracted and to imagine that others' lives are shiny and perfect, they're not. So this is all a, a gentle reminder from the plague. And but, but when people are worried about, you know, millions of people worried about their jobs, worried about work, worried uh, finances, what do, you, what do you say to people when they feel powerless in those feelings? Look, I mean, you know, a lot of the time in, our, in, in, in modern society, we are supposed to be totally in charge of our destinies. And the number one question that people will ask you when they meet you for the first time is, what do you do? And you better have an impressive answer to what you do. You are your job and your performance in the marketplace, which makes it so difficult because on top of our financial worries, we've got kind of status worries. We feel that people won't like us unless we're doing terrifically. In a way, again, the silver lining of this time is if things are not going terrifically for you and the economy is really wobbling in lots of parts, it's genuinely not your fault. Mm. We are not always responsible for whatever happens to us. You know, your biography is not who you are. You know, sometimes we can be terribly snobbish. And what I mean by snobbish is we judge, we take, we take a small part of what people are, what's on their business card, how they've been doing this month. And that becomes the whole of who they are. It never is. We're all of us far richer than merely our jobs. And I think this crisis is forcing us for better or for worse to see each other in a far larger kind of context. Um, we, are, we are much more than the economy tells us we are. And when the economies go mad, um, we, we deserve to rediscover one another as human beings. Can I ask also, you? Just, yeah, go on. just if I can say one thing, you know, we've got a lot of parents, right? A lot of parents are going, oh, I'm not teaching my child. This is, that's exactly what I was just about, I was right. about to you know, ask but, but, you about parenting and what do I say to my children right? when they're well, going you know, through these things. Well, this is it, you know, so much worry. And it, it, it comes down to it because we've got this background idea that the only good parent is the perfect parent. Now, here's the truth. If you are trying to be a perfect parent, you are putting your, road, your, your child on a one-way road to psychosis. No child needs a perfect parent. And you know why? Because the world is imperfect. And ultimately, the job of being a parent is to prepare your child for what the world is actually like. So if you prepare your, your child for an idea that the world is perfect and you as the parental representative is this some superhuman being, you're actually doing them a disservice. They're going to have a terrific crash with reality and it's going to be grim. Much better that they meet the disappointment of life through you an ordinary, flawed, but loving and gentle soul as the average parent is. And that is how you're preparing your kid for reality. So ditch the Mandarin, ditch the perfection, ditch the sourdough, and just reveal yourself to your own child as a loving, um, you know, hardworking, but ultimately human being. And that is the much greater gift than trying to be perfect mum or dad. As I say, no one needs a perfect mum or dad. They only need a good enough mum or dad. That's all we ever need. I'm interested to know, so many people look to you for guidance in their lives. Who do you look to for your guidance uh, when you're sort of struggling? H how do you cultivate these very thoughts that you're sharing with us now? Look, I think that all of us have got a little voice of common sense inside us but we don't let it emerge. But I think all of us you know, know how to be a great friend for other people, but very often we don't speak as friends to ourselves. You know, if most of us saw how we treat ourselves, you know, we're cruel to ourselves. We're so kind when a friend calls up saying, you know, how can you help me? But with ourselves, we're quite mean. And I think one of the great lessons of life is become a friend to yourself. And one of the ways to do that is just to go, if I wasn't me, how would I advise me? And you know the answer. 
At that point, you will have a good answer. So use it for the person that really matters to you, which is you. Um, it's, it's so ironic that we don't know how to apply the generosity and the minimum of compassion that we show to strangers, to ourselves. And, you know, again, at this time, more than any other, be a friend to yourself. Show yourself the tolerance that you know that others deserve. You deserve it too. I mean, so many conversations that people are having right now are all about when this will be over when will it be over when do you think we'll be able to do x y and z what do you think we can learn from this the other side and what i guess what do you hope we hang on to when we do as we inevitably will get the other side of this virus you know it's so interesting for me um so often in life um, there are great ideas that people don't put into motion. And when you say, why don't you put that idea into motion? They go, you know, it's never been done before. Um, this is just the way we always do it. It would be too difficult to change. We have turned the world more or less upside down in you know, five weeks. The traditions that were steady for 300 years have been changed in an afternoon. Some of these things have been difficult for people, but others have been glorious revolutions. And I think that what we most need to take away from this crisis is we can change things and we can change things not over 10 years, but over like an afternoon. Mm. Um, we can radically change how we live and be imaginative and courageous. And we doesn't have to be perfect the way we redesign things, but we can play, we can experiment, we can try to make life the more fulfilling and exciting and genuinely joyful thing that we know in our hearts we all want. But so often we're held back by tradition. Let's throw the bad traditions out of, uh, uh, out of the window and try and be ambitious about how we want to live. Something you said that uh, has stuck with me, you said, um, you said all anybody really wants is to be seen and heard and treated with kindness. Do you think in this time we are seeing more greater actions of people seeing each other who perhaps we may have walked past daily? Totally, totally. I mean, look, you know, being famous, right? Why do most people want to be famous? Is it because, you know, they want the large houses? No, it's much more poignant and much more universal. Most people want to be famous for something very simple. They just want people to notice and be kind to them. At the moment, it's not so possible to be famous. You know, it's like even famous people are like just having to be ordinary people. And that provides everyone with a kind of opening because what we're realizing is it wasn't the fame that people want. It's the respect, the regard, the chat, the, the just acknowledging somebody else's humanity. That is, you know, we talk so much about romantic love. We, we're a kind of romantic love obsessed society. But again, we don't really necessarily need romantic love. All we need is the love that occurs in a very simple and natural way when two people, two strangers, might exchange a pleasant word in a supermarket, or they might, you know, just give each other a friendly glance, acknowledge each other's humanity. That ultimately is the only love we need and the only fame we need. So let's do away with that endless focus on one very, very special person who you'll get on with perfectly and everything's going to be, you know, hunky-dory. No, you know, let's try and rediscover friendship. This is an age of friendship when we're rediscovering the love that's within the concept of friendship, which we normally downgrade so much. You know, think of two people on a date going, oh, you know, I've been friend zoned. This person only wanted to be friends. Friendship is a glorious thing. This is a time of friendship. We can't go and, you know, head out to a romantic weekend, etc. We're all separated from one another, but we're rediscovering words and connection. And that's the most beautiful of all things. I'm so grateful to you coming to talk to us tonight. I, I urge everybody at home to, uh, to go and search out any of, uh, of Alan's work over the, over the past few years. It is all going to be of great help to you through all this. For more information about Alan's books and The School of Life, you can go to theschooloflife.com.